morning or good afternoon or good evening depending on where you are in the world uh, on behalf of RBCS welcome to today's webinar on testing mobile applications I'm Rex Black president of RBCS a worldwide testing and quality assurance firm we serve clients ranging from small startups to fortune 20 global enterprises since 1994, RBCS has delivered insight and confidence to hundreds of clients around the world. We have a team of international consultants that deliver customized training, consulting, and outsourcing services for companies that are looking to improve their test and quality assurance practices. I am the author of many books on software testing as well as being the past president of the ISTQB. Attendance at today's webinar earns PMI PDUs. I would like to thank Vicki Sasser for reviewing the material for PDU status and for making valuable suggestions. Attendees will receive an email telling them how to claim PDUs, including the PDU code. PDUs are available for live webinar attendance only. Uh, before we start, a couple notes. If you have any questions throughout the course of the webinar, Feel free to submit them at any time via your webinar interface, but please note that they are answered only at the end. Uh, there is no need to ask for presentation copies. The presentation is on the web. Go to our new website, rbcs-us.com. It's all new and improved. I think you'll find it much easier to locate things. Uh, and just search for the uh, name of the presentation, and uh, you will find it. By attending this webinar, you are automatically registered for the free e-learning drawing. Check your email over the next couple days and watch the spam filter. Last month we had our first uh, second time winner. Um, so it's proof that if you watch this, if you attend these long enough, not only can you win once, you could even win twice. Hope you enjoy this free webinar from RBCS. We do these free webinars as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS we are a not just for profit company. Okay, so. <clears throat> Mobile apps. What do we need to know about testing mobile apps um, so that we can achieve uh, good quality in a very fast-paced uh, uh, market? So um, when we talk about mobile apps, um, there are there's sort of a spectrum here of, uh, on, on the one hand, the 100% native mobile application. So this is actual code executing on the um, mobile device itself. And on the other hand, you have mobile optimized websites where the, the code per se, what makes up your, your app, your mobile app, um, is actually residing on a web server somewhere and is served to the uh, browser on your mobile device. So basically none of your code is really running. It's being interpreted by the, uh, by the browser. Uh, and uh, there are spots in between there, of course, as well. So uh, but those are kind of the two, the two extremes. So what we're talking about here is that whole gamut of... Uh, 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 implementation from from the native mobile app to the mobile optimized website and when I say mobile optimized um, website um, I'm also including within that the uh, of the self adapting um, websites um, that, that are being built now so it, it was the case up until fairly recently that if you wanted to have a mobile site, you actually had to uh, build um, a specific site uh, designed just for mobile and then detect where the, whether the person was accessing it with a mobile device and um, redirect uh, from the full site to the mobile site. Uh, with the new responsive um, types of implementations, you now have a the, the website is able to capture that information about what is the device that's being used to access me and then adapt on the fly. So I would include that as a mobile optimized website as well. So it's whether it's mobile optimized in a static fashion, a la the old school approach of a separate site for mobile devices or mobilized uh, dynamically um, with uh, the responsive technologies that would also be a mobile optimized website. Um, 
Now, uh, companies need to find a way to get to make their content uh, mobile accessible. The number of hours spent online, um, mobile versus uh, um, mobile mobile technology versus uh, PC apps, is um, uh, totally flipped around in the last five years. If you go and look at some of the uh, um, statistics on how much time people spend online on a PC versus time spent online on a mobile device, uh, I mean, it was you know a good five years ago. The PC was obviously the dominant way of getting online, and now it's the other way around. The mobile devices, and what's interesting about that is if you look at the trends. While the total amount of time spent online on a PC continues to increase, it's that the the time spent online on mobile uh, devices has increased so much faster that it has overtaken and is completely outstripping time spent on the PCs. So it's really important for companies to be able to uh, get their content in front of people regardless of the uh, platform that that person is using to access the content. Um, and so in this um, situation, the companies basically have the, the option of you know, going with the full native app, uh, going with an optimized site, whether responsive or that's old school style, or just directing people to their full site. Now, of course, the original thing was let people go to the full site on their mobile devices, and nobody liked that very much um, because of the just horrible um, readability and usability. Uh, but native apps are um, are a ex very expensive way to go. So um, you know the mobile optimized site is was of course a uh, kind of a cheaper on ramp. Now with this new responsive technology that becomes an even cheaper on ramp, uh, it will be interesting to see whether that leads people uh, leads organizations towards fewer native apps or not over time. I would expect not. But regardless of how your company goes about approaching supporting mobile, you need to have the ability to deal with the various challenges um, that arise and the somewhat different uh, criteria for success that are associated with the, um, the ways in which your company chooses to go mobile. Now, um, <clears throat> for the most part, People are going to be using either a smartphone or, or a tablet, possibly a netbook. Dumb phones, at least in um, industrialized economies, are pretty much a thing of the past. So, um, you know, unless you are serving a market that is still stuck with, with relatively dumb phones, older generation phones, then you probably uh, don't need to worry about those. Uh, of course, it's important to know whether you are. Um, you know, I heard a fascinating, if depressing, report um, about six or six or eight months ago. Um, this person had gone to the Syrian refugee camps in the Middle East, and it turns out that the most important thing, bar none, was a smartphone. Um, the most important possession. I mean, over food, people would um, trade away their food in order to get money to pay their their uh, phone bills. Um, so, you know, if you're creating an app to be used in that kind of situation, then, you know, you might have to think about, well, what kind of technology do these folks actually have? Um, now, there are, of course, wearable devices like the um, Apple Watch. Um, you know, if you've received a package from FedEx or, or UPS, you've had to sign for it on one of their proprietary boxes. Those would be mobile, too, and that would... A purpose-built mobile device is going to have some additional challenges above and beyond the testing challenges associated with a uh, uh, more general-purpose mobile device. So you'd have to um, include those considerations in your, your thinking. So here what I'm going to do in the next uh, 45 minutes or so is give you some, some thoughts about uh, mobile application testing, some of the challenges, the issues that you have to overcome and uh, get you... Um, Get you thinking, hopefully, in a in an expanded way over over what uh, what you need to do. As I mentioned here, this is derived from our two-day mobile testing foundation course, 
which we also present as a three-day uh, virtual course. Um, <clears throat> So there's there's expectations and there's reality and you know to the uh, to the extent that your um, users expectations are beyond the reality that you can actually provide then you have a quality problem. Uh, J.M. Duran's famous definition of quality is fitness for use. Well you know, fitness for use, I mean, use is in the eye of the user, right? And so the user decides whether something is fit for their use, um, and that is based on comparison of what actually happens against their expectations. So, you know, differences between the, the real user experience and the desired user experience is the gap in quality between where your product is and where your user wants it to be. And if somewhere between that gap, uh, somewhere in, in that gap, uh, lies your competitor's uh, product in terms of quality, well, guess what? I mean, there's, it's, they're only a download away, right? So, you know, people who are using mobile apps, they tend to have pretty low tolerance for quality problems. Um, they want to be able to access uh, regardless. Um, they don't want to have to spend time studying or even looking at the thing to figure out what it does. They want to just be able to go, ah, okay, it does this, bang, off, I'm doing it. They want it to respond quickly regardless of the connection, and they want updates. They want new features, and they want bug fixes. So, again, the um, to the extent that your app does not deliver um, to the user's expectations, whether you consider those expectations reasonable or not, if somewhere in that gap between the user's expectations and your delivery appears your competitor, um, you could be gone. Um, gone from that user's device, uh, and if enough users uh, decide to uh, bail out, then, you know, gone like gone for good, gone like company gone. Um, now, even if you're writing a mobile app that's going to be used by employees, um, that's still got some risk. Yes, you don't have the abandonment, abandonment issues potentially, but could certainly result in inefficiency and ineffectiveness. So I, I have a client, for example, that does um, has an app that is delivered to their uh, sales associates on, the, on their, their store floors and their brick and mortar locations. And that app runs on iPhones, and uh, uh, the app allows them to uh, locate particular items in inventory. And if they don't have it in their store, they can load it, locate it in another store. So, meanwhile, while this while the sales associate is using this app, the customer is sitting there tapping their foot and watching them. Um, so, you know, it can be kind of uncomfortable if the thing is slow, and that would result in, of course, pushback from the sales managers. And this is likely to just get um, more and more intense, <clears throat> and the implications are not just for the functionality, what the app allows someone to do, but also reliability, especially in the face of potentially flaky connections, uh, performance, again, and potentially in the face of flaky or, or um, inconsistent uh, connections from a performance point of view. And, of course, usability, or also referred to as user experience or UX. Um, so needs to be able to do what people, the apps need to be able to do what people want them to do um, in a reliable way, quickly, and in a way that is, uh, you know, trivially easy. So <clears throat> with that in mind, let's take a look at an example. I mean, what, what, would, what would be a way of focusing our testing on the user? Um, well, let's say that we're looking at a mobile application for an airline like Delta or United or something like that. So first off, you got to think about, okay, the user, the user, the, the end user, the target user is generally going to be a frequent flyer. And what are they going to need the app to be able to do for them? Well, um, checking to see what's going on with their flight. Um, 
I do this a lot. I'm about to get on a plane. I got like an hour before the flight leaves. I got to go, hmm, am I going to get a meal on this plane or do I need to go buy some sort of, you know, horrible overpriced airline, airplane, airport food and bring it on the, the plane? I don't want that to be hard to figure out, and I want to be able to get an answer to that question pretty quickly. Um, unfortunately, sometimes this doesn't always work. I just noticed a, a couple of weeks ago that the Delta app showed a little fork, knife, and wine glass icon next to my flight. And it wasn't until I drilled a little deeper into it, I was like, oh, refreshments. Okay, I know, you know, bag of peanuts is not exactly qualified me in, in my mind as, you know, fork, knife, and glass of wine type of icon. You know, how about a little icon that just shows a bag of peanuts? <laughs> you know, it'd be more accurate. Um <clears throat> What's the weather where I'm going? Can I see a map of the airport? Um, that's the kind of thing I'm going to want. That's going to involve interoperability because the app is going to need to talk to outside um, applications for that information. Um, I would like the app to work the same way on a phone, a tablet, regardless. So, you know, the user interface um, really should be pretty um, similar so I don't have to relearn if I'm using my Kindle Fire versus if I'm using my smartphone to access the Delta.com app you know I wanted to show me the same thing um, <clears throat> network um, settings you know regardless of the kind of connectivity I have if I have connectivity I want to be able to use it um, a lot of times when I need to get to the app to make some sort of change or to check something out there's a problem and it's basically, it's a problem that was created by the airline, typically, like they, you know, didn't fix the plane fast enough when it broke, and now I'm late for my flight, my connection, and so forth. I don't want to be frustrated while I'm trying to basically get the information I need to fix the problem that the airline has created by their mistake, uh, to be further frustrated by the um, app um, being slow or not you know crashing or being really persnickety about the speed of connection that it has. I mean, I I need help cleaning up their mess, right? So I'm not going to be very uh, um, tolerant of that. And just in general, I don't want the app to crash on me. I don't want it to be slow. I want it to be something that helps me navigate what is often an inherently frustrating experience, uh, which which is business travel. Um, you know, it's sometimes for those of you who don't do a lot of it, it, it might be portrayed as kind of glamorous and fun. The being there is great, <clears throat> you know, definitely being getting to go to different locations and spend some time there and meet people with different cultures and so forth. That's that's great stuff. But the getting there is not fun, as anybody who spends time on airlines regularly will tell you. So, you know, the app. Is, is should be basically a form of, of um, you know, pain relief for the inherently rather painful experience, uh, not yet another element of, of the pain. Um, now, the airlines also need to be seen as stakeholders in this, too. So they have some additional um, things that, that, that are important to them um, that need to be addressed from a testing point of view. So localization for their international customers, supporting different languages. Um, I would like to be able to, if I'm an airline, support people actually making a purchase. So I want that functionality to be there. That might not be particularly high on the frequent flyers list, um, but, you know, trying to get some additional revenue out of the customer um, you know, probably something the airline wants. Um, and, you know, it's the, the, it should be, hopefully, the app is a tool that helps them gain market share. And by satisfying the, uh, the um, user's expectations that I just mentioned, um, that I, the airline one, will be able to do that in a way which is better than the other airlines, airline two, airline three, airline four, and so forth, such that the 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 um, pleasantness of the app is kind of a thumb on the scale that helps my frequent flyer choose my airline over some other airline. So all of these things have to be considered. <clears throat> uh, 
Now, this is made complicated by your well, this your your existence as a, a tester in the in the world of testing mobile apps is made comp complicated by this sort of big bang um, that we're living in a sort of a three dimensional big bang, in the sense that um, <clears throat> people figure out new and interesting ways for mobile software to be used. So you know, you things that things run the gamut from Candy Crush and the Kim Kardashian game or whatever that's all about to one of my clients that does uh, medical uh, installation and administration software. Um, they, they have apps that run on uh, tablets that are carried by doctors and nurses and physicians assistants and so forth and they're used for uh, diagnostic and records keeping purposes so they're actually in a safety critical kind of setting. So the kinds of uses exploding uh, that's one dimension. The number of mobile users also exploding um, it's you know that's just uh, what what was seen just uh, a few years ago as a really noble goal this laptop for every child is now just you know put a smartphone in everybody's hand uh, because there are mobile users worldwide. Um, and so, um, you know, if you think, it's, it's pretty remarkable the, the computing horsepower that's in a smartphone now is probably closing in on what was in a data center uh, 60, 70 years ago. Um, and, you know, there's that famous quote from the head of IBM um, back in the late 40s or early 50s about you know, he, he, he couldn't imagine that there would need to be more than uh, a few dozen uh, computers in the world. Um, I think that was him. I've also heard that quote attributed to a guy named Gene Amdahl, but whoever said it, um, it has to go down as one of the worst uh, predictions uh, outside of this year's presidential campaign in the United States. Um, so, you know, we now have literally billions of computers spread around the world in all sorts of people's hands, and the diversity of those devices continues to expand as well. The Internet of Things, which is where this is ultimately going, is this, you know, there's a computer everywhere. Every room has a computer, every stoplight, every appliance, you know, that's all, we have IP addresses around the world, and we, we get into the sort of minority report type of existence. If you remember that movie and the Tom Cruise character as he's trying to run down a hallway is being accosted by a billboard that's like trying to pitch him on getting a nice cold Guinness, um, which, you know, might not have been a bad um, thought for him at that particular moment in time, if you remember that movie. So you have all these new devices coming out. And you think of the devices themselves, they can be configured in different ways because the software is being updated on an ongoing basis. So, you know, just because you're holding the same physical object as you were uh, four weeks ago does not mean that it is the same in the sense of the as a hardware software system. And this is really, this dimension here, the dimension of of software releases is, uh, you know, a, a real deluge, and you as a tester or test manager might feel like this guy getting hit by a water cannon, um, which is just that there's constant software updates happening, and even even if your app, you know, even if the people that you're working with aren't, aren't running around screaming DevOps, DevOps, continuous delivery, then people out there in your ecosystem are screaming DevOps, DevOps, continuous delivery, and then you're getting stuff that's changing on the platform that you run on, including possibly even the operating system, which all has the potential to ripple through to your app. So, um, you know, you, your app can regress even though you haven't changed it uh, because um, somebody else uh, made a change that, that, uh, that uh, undermined an assumption you had about the, the environment that you're in. And of course, you got management running around screaming DevOps, DevOps, continuous in delivery, and, and uh, because that's kind of the buzzword, and you know, management doesn't necessarily know what DevOps means or entails, or agile for that matter, but they know fast is good because you know, 
fast fast is great and they've picked up on the silicon valley um buzzword that's out there of fail fast you know which just gets interpreted as it doesn't matter if we fail so as testers we have to help people understand that you know there's a fine line between speed to market and junk to market and if we get the reputation of being purveyors of junk um, that could have a long-term deleterious effect now all of these things are challenges of course there is some some good news here is that it, in addition to the proliferation of these software releases and so forth there's a lot of tools that are available um, and a lot of free tools are available so there are things that can help you if you have the technical skills to use the tools and you have the time to integrate the use of those tools into a larger uh, strategy to do adequate testing of all of the different relevant quality characteristics um, ideally prior to release um, and an important thing is that d don't be just fixated on um, you know uh, what's in this current release you, you need to think about this whole process of installation updates deinstallations um, upgrades um, this the, in, problematic design with respect to this installation and upgrade process can lead to some very significant testability issues as um, some of my clients know to their chagrin so if you're involved on the ground floor as a tester from you know sometimes called the greenfield perspective make sure that people are thinking about testability of the installation and upgrade update and upgrade processes or you know you will you will pay the price later now this is an example of the uh, delta app running on uh, I believe it's a windows phone um, so if you are testing the Delta.com website for use on a PC, you could sit in a test lab and use a wireless connection and a wired connection and test that. And um, maybe you'd want to diddle with the wireless connection a little bit to test what it's like if somebody's got a relatively poor wireless connection. But you don't actually have to move around Mobile devices, well, mobile devices move around and the connectivity changes, so can you just test a mobile app in a test lab? How many of these different devices are you going to need? Okay. The Windows phones have different size screens, as do the Android phones and the iPhones, I believe. So how many different ones are we going to need? Uh, functionality, okay, that's important. Reliability, performance usability portability uh, what's our process for dealing with um, our, our releases how frequently are there going to be releases uh, what can go wrong if um, this app doesn't work so these are all things that need to be considered and they uh, some of them are to just common testing considerations some of them are a little more uh, um, unique to the mobile world now especially this whole issue of the um, the supported uh, devices. So uh, apologies to the artist Goya here. I, I borrowed his painting called The Drowning Dog. Um, and you might be able to relate to the, the look in that poor hound's eyes there of, oh my God, I'm, I'm drowning here. Um, because, you know, if you think about the expectations of your users again, um, you know, if I'm if I'm in, in a situation on, and I'm having a problem, a travel problem, say, so I'm on, it could be United, it could be Delta, maybe, uh, some other airline, but let's say I, I grab my phone um, and I'm not able to get to get, get a connection on my phone for whatever reason. Um, so I grab my tablet, my Kindle Fire tablet, which is basically kind of sort of Android tablet. Um, I want to be able to use that the same way to solve the same problem. If I get a connection on one, I want to be able to do it on that one. If I, Otherwise, if I get the connection on the other, I do it on the other. I don't want to have to diddle around with the thing and figure out what's different about this versus that. Um, so from, from your perspective, what you see is, okay, there's a portability issue there, right? There's also a data migration issue. 
meaning that if somebody does something on uh, one platform um, and then they go on to the other platform, they should be able to see that that change that they made, for example, changing the, their seat, shows up on the new platform. Pardon me, I need a drink of water there. Um, also, the, that common look and feel. Um, people will tolerate some amount of uh, predictable user interface difference from one device to another, but they don't want it to just be completely, you know, uh, uh, gratuitous and, and, you know, for no good, for no apparent reason. So you need to know, okay, what are all the intended target devices? And, of course, management might not make this easy for you because they might just be able to go everything. Or they say one thing, and then the next day they come in and go, whoa, yeah, remember that list we gave you yesterday? Well, you got to add this, this, and this because now, you know, we got these new orders in. Um, so you're likely to find that um, this is going to be a major challenge for you. Now, you could be lucky, like my client that has the sales associates all carrying iPhones. They are able to standardize and go, okay, we're locked down on a, the iPhone as the target platform, so that makes testing a lot easier. But, you know, even there, you want to be careful with that because it, eventually the, your company might go, well, we want to go BYOD or bring your own device because we're tired of buying people phones when they already have phones. Um, and so, you know, now you, you're going to have to um, consider that. And how big of a problem this is going to be and how exactly it affects testing is going to depend on the, the kind of app that you're testing. So getting back to that spectrum that I was alluding to before, uh, you know, if, if you just go, well, we got a website, and, you know, it's built with this responsive technology, so we test it on the PC, and so, yeah, that's fine. It look, you know, it's going to look the same thing because, you know, we don't have a special native app. It's going to look the same on the, on the mobile device. Well, no, it won't. That's the whole point of the responsive technology. Um, so if it's, if it's doing that and it's basically self-optimizing or if you have a mobile-optimized website, even if you don't have any logic running on the um, phone itself other, other than the browser, you know, you still you got to think about, okay, well, there's different browsers and different devices and different screen resolutions and so forth. Okay, I got to look at that. Um, what if some of the uh, um, connectivity, or excuse me, some of the uh, logic has been pushed down to the front end, pushed down so into the browser, so you now have a sort of a thicker client kind of approach. Okay, well, to what extent is that dependent on different kinds of connectivity? Um, maybe there's some stuff that can, can run in a semi-connected or disconnected state, Maybe. Um, now, if you're a pure native mobile app, you know, that. how many different configurations have you got? Um, are you going to be able to have all of the hardware? Probably not. So you're probably dependent on some sort of simulators or maybe some mix of that with outside labs, though you now have to worry about with the outside labs leakage of intellectual property. Now, if you've got a hybrid application where there's some stuff that is done native and then some stuff that's in the web, again, you're kind of in the, in the, the worst of, of all possible worlds there, that all of the risks <laughs> that, are, that I've mentioned here and, and sort of none of the mitigations will apply to you. So here's the, um, on an Android phone, um, the native app, in the middle and the mobile op the mobile optimized website on the right and notice that this is a this is not a responsive technology at least it doesn't appear to be because it's got m.delta.com so that's specially built um, now again from the user's point of view I don't care um, I'm sort of like the honey badger if you know that uh, particular video of not <laughs> Look it up on YouTube. Uh, I don't. I don't really care which of these things I'm using. I'm just. I've got a problem to solve, and I want to be able to solve it. Um, and it seems to offer. Both seem to offer the same sort of features, but the code, of course, is completely different. And what's happening on the client side in in those two cases is completely different. Is you know, there's a browser executing versus native code. 
even the server side stuff is not the same because in the case of the uh, native app, it's not going to be talking to the web server. It's going to be talking to some other server, uh, which might be part of the whole complex of servers that is ultimately in the mix with the mobile site, but it's not the interface you're going through. So from a testing point of view, you know, not, not what you, um, you don't want to make those kind of uh, quote unquote simplifying assumptions. There's also the interesting um, aspect of I can work at least with some features uh, disconnected on the native app, which I can't do on the mobile, uh, the mobile optimized website. So all of these are things that have to be taken into account and I can't just assume I've tested one and therefore the other is going to work. You learn very little about the um, bugginess or lack thereof of the mobile optimized website by testing the mobile native mobile app and vice versa. So representative devices. You're going to have to think about what constitutes proper representative devices for uh, testing purposes. Now equivalence partitioning is a technique that I would hope that all of you know. It's a testing technique that has been around for quite a long time. Uh, was described in Glenford Meyer's book, The Art of Software Testing, which was published in the 1970s. But it's certainly that the technique existed well before that because Myers was describing testing techniques that were in common usage at IBM and had been in common usage at IBM for some time when he wrote the book. So you can use equivalence partitioning to say, okay, these are devices that we think are you know, representative of our larger um, environment, larger milieu, if you will, of the, of the devices that will be in use. Um, you have to be careful, though, that you take the equivalence partitioning far enough, but not too far. Take it too far, you're going to have too many devices, and it's going to cost a lot to uh, deal with that. Uh, not far enough, and you're going to be assuming that uh, different devices that have important differences are going to work exactly the same, and then that's, that's not going to be true. So you have to think about devices and how you're going to make a balance of, um, you know, just just enough, a sort of a Goldilocks selection in terms of uh, the, the number of devices to, to uh, represent in your test environment. You have to think about which tests are likely to behave differently on different devices versus which tests can just be scattered across devices more or less randomly. Um, and you also need to think about things that wouldn't be common to think about if you're just testing the standard old PC app on a laptop or desktop, uh, which is uh, um, <clears throat> which is the uh, um, case with, uh, with mobile apps. You've got to think about things like, okay, you know, what are people going to be using this movie? So for example, if you've got a GPS type of app and the way you test that is by moving it around from one location to another and then but but only only using it when you're in a particular location that of course is not representative at all of how the user is going to use it um, so the um, uh, example of uh, applying equivalence partitioning um, you can look at things like the manufacturer um, you can look at things like the operating system. You can look at things like supported peripherals, uh, if you're going to support peripherals. If you, you know, like for example, if keyboards are a big deal, um, Bluetooth keyboards, then you know because you're a very text-centric application, then obviously you want to think about that. Maybe you don't need to do that at all. Uh, the different browsers, cameras, the resolution, and so forth. So, you know, be careful here when you're thinking about representative devices that you don't just think about um, uh, manufacturer and model uh, there's there's more to it than that um, <clears throat> now as um, a lot of you probably know um, the standard sort of uh, sequential model V model type of life cycle is um, not very common. 
in a uh, mobile world. Um, <clears throat> so at the very least, you could expect that uh, what you would see would be some sort of agile methodology. Um, I would be surprised to find, and except in the case of safety critical type of devices, that people were were applying a, a, a sequential or V-model life cycle. Um, you'd um, also see various forms of Kanban, lean or Kanban, where, where things are being released as they're being developed, and even getting into the DevOps, uh, continuous uh, delivery uh, type of, uh, of situations. Um, <clears throat> now, it's also possible to use what's called spiral development. So I was just talking to a client uh, last week who is using spiral development, um, which spiral development, if you're not familiar with it, is basically a form of uh, rapid prototyping and then testing of those prototypes. Um, and that, that can be used when you're in sort of an experimental or early, early development phase. Um, <clears throat> now, testers sometimes have kind of mixed feelings about um, the, these different life cycle models. And um, the thing, the thing that to keep in mind is, yes, there are there are challenges with the very fast-paced life cycle models, uh, but it's better than what will be likely to happen in a uh, uh, attempt to apply sequential life cycle models to mobile development, given the rapid pace, which would be that the testing, which happens at the end, would get uh, brutally squeezed. I was just talking to a potential client about a week ago about this, and he was saying that they they do embedded systems um, for the automotive industry, and they're on a V model. And he says it's just brutal because what happens is that you know schedule slips, 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 and then boom, you know your testing goes from two weeks down to a few days, um, and so that would certainly be a an ongoing problem in a mobile world where the pressure to release is um, is so high. So risk-based testing is certainly going to be a big deal here. Um, I'm sure that a lot of you have heard me talk about risk-based testing in the past. If you haven't, um, you can certainly go out to the website and access the various recorded free webinars that are out there um, and uh, take a listen to that. Uh, of course, also you know, if you want more help with that, it's something that we can help with. Um, now, it is important that you and your management team uh, consider, regardless of the lifecycle model, what's, um, what are we testing here and how bad is it going to be if it fails? So, you know, the kind of the medical management um, systems that I was talking about before, you know, you, you don't want somebody to be just kind of screwing around with that and going, oh, well, you know, let's just get it out there and see what happens. Oh, gee, that's too bad. It mirror imaged some x-ray, and because of that, uh, somebody transplanted the wrong lung. Um, you know, I mean, I'm being only partly uh, sarcastic here. There, there have been situations where IT was a contributor where that kind of thing did happen. Um, so you have to be very, very careful. Um, with those kind of applications, and it's fine. I've got clients that use um, agile development methodologies for safety uh, critical devices, but there are things that you have to do to be careful about that. You know, versus if you're testing Candy Crush or something like that, um, you know, what's the risk? What's the worst thing that can happen? Now, one thing that you'll also have to maybe push back on a little bit is this, well, you know, we can just do an over-the-air update, and the, you know, if we break something, we'll just get it fixed. And then there was the, you know, the famous uh, Zuckerberg of Facebook quote about, and I'm paraphrasing here, break, um, you know, break stuff and uh, move quickly. Um, you know, that's that's all fine if you're Facebook, and the only thing that you're doing is temporarily inconveniencing someone from posting pictures of their dinner. Um, but you know, when you're in a in a situation where what you're doing really matters. Um, just the fact that you can quickly uh, fix a bug doesn't mean that you have undone the reputational damage that the bug created. Software might be 
very plastic and malleable in that way, but uh, the user's uh, recollections of quality were, were not equally malleable. Um, yeah, and so this just to follow that on. I mean, you know, if you're if you're doing something like Yelp, um, you're doing something like Candy Crush, you're doing something like Facebook, then just getting stuff out there, throwing throwing things out there, and let see people try it, see if they like it. You know, that might be a uh, a reasonable strategy. And if as a tester you were um, uh, trying to apply the same mindset that you would apply to testing something safety critical to Yelp or Facebook or Candy Crush, then you know, you'd almost certainly be making a, an irrelevant obstacle out of yourself. Uh, but the, the shoe can be on the other foot there too. Um, I have had um, situations where, where clients have told me about uh, people coming into regulated environments like FDA regulated medical devices and so forth and applying the same kind of approaches that you would apply to consumer electronics and you know management when they discover being horrified saying no 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 no, no. you got to be a lot more careful than that and the record keeping has to be a lot more thorough so you know help management understand um, and manage the risk, but at the same time, you need to understand and, and manage the risk too in an appropriate way, not an obstacle-y kind of way, if that's if obstacle-y is a word. Now, <clears throat> there's always this temptation when something new comes along to just go, hey, that changes everything, and we don't need to know any of those things that we used to know before, and we can just forget all about that because this is all new stuff. Well, no, I mean, you... you Mobile apps, ex a lot of them exhibit state-dependent types of behaviors. So knowing how to use state transition diagrams to design tests is an important skill. Uh, are you going to get a you know very detailed marketing requirements document? Probably not, but you should be able to take a use case or a user story, analyze it, and figure out what needs to be tested based on that. Uh, are you going to be writing concrete test cases and you know very very detailed scripts? Well, probably not, but that's an important thing to consider of what does need to be documented and how does that information need to be captured? How are you going to report your results? These are all things that are uh, well established uh, best practices out there for for making those kinds of decisions, and um, you know you should you should know those. Um, if you're using an agile or a lean life cycle, then you know knowing this, the tester skills are relevant uh, in those areas is, is also uh, important. So that's in addition to <clears throat> the functional testing tasks that are uh, arise from the specific device and um, any sort of non-functional issues like security and usability and performance, portability, compatibility, etc. And the non-functional stuff is interesting because in the, you know, quote-unquote uh, good old days, um, you'd have um, a separate group oftentimes that was responsible for functional, for non-functional types of tests. Like you'd have a security team and a user experience team and then in terms of things like performance and reliability, that would be something possibly handled by a separate team. You might own portability and compatibility, but some of these other things you could just say, ah, it's out of scope for me. But uh, a lot of uh, organizations that are doing mobile development, they don't really have that luxury because there's uh, just them. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've talked to mobile uh, testers who are like, yeah, I'm it. I'm, I'm the dude. I'm, I am the test department. Hear me roar. Um, and so, you know, it's, uh, if, you, if you're coming from a background where these kinds of non-functional things have been, you know, someone else's problem, uh, that might not be the case for you anymore. So, um, again, keep in mind that um, the... Um, Customer and user expectations for you in terms of mobile apps are going to be pretty much brutal, pretty much unrelenting. Uh, that because of the literally millions of 
apps that are out there in the various app stores and, and the, those millions of apps costing nothing or very close to it, like 99 cents or something like that. Um, even if you make someone pay a dollar or two dollars or five dollars or whatever for your app, it's very unlikely that they're going to feel in any way invested into it. So any amount of disappointment is probably going to just result in them going, shine, I'm going somewhere else. And this is all happening in the context of an ongoing explosion of, of different devices, um, the um, heterogeneity of the user um, community continues to increase, the kinds of problems that are being solved with these devices is um, continuing to grow, and as I said, gro it's growing even faster than what's happening in the traditional PC land, which is still growing. So um, it's uh, it's a uh, certainly very, very challenging environment in that way. Um, the the whole, you know, get it out there as quickly as possible adds some additional challenges. Uh, not only is your software going to be changing, but other people's software that affects your software is used by your software is changing. So these are all things that you have to put uh, um, effective strategies in place for. Um, and also, um, this is, is very important, uh, think about skills. So you need to have the foundational types of skills, and in some cases even advanced level skills. Um, that's very important. Nothing that's happening here obsolete skills like doing a proper quality risk analysis or doing good um, test design, but there are additional skills that you'll need. And, uh, you know, given, given um, where we are from a software engineering point of view, the skills of the people doing the work uh, continues to be and will for the at least short-term and medium-term future uh, continue to be probably the most important uh, contributor to uh, the effectiveness and the efficiency of development organizations. Okay, so I'll put the advertisement up as always and we will go um, to questions. And somebody reporting that they could not hear earlier on, but that was a single isolated report, so I'm going to assume that they had some connectivity issues. Um, a question from Amit here. You mentioned several times the connection speed. As a user, I accept the fact that web pages load slower on mobile networks. I would assume that taking a bit of time to actually get information from a remote server would be acceptable as long as there is a clear marking. Uh, that the app is contacting the internet. Well, I think, well, maybe, I don't know. I mean, I mean, one of the things that we have to realize as technologists is that we are not the typical target user. That it's possible for us to understand what's happening and why it takes longer, but, you know, a lot of people, they're, they're just, they're not going to understand that or they're not going to care. They're going to be like, look, I can, when I'm on my PC, this stuff comes right up. And some of those delays too, I mean, it's, I don't think it's fair for us to ask that users just put up with them because of connection speeds, because some of those delays are due to uh, putting content out there that stands in the way of the user getting to the content that they want. So I run into this all the time on my on my smartphone and tablets is it's sitting there. Part of what I want to look at is on the screen, but I can't get to the rest of it because it's sitting there downloading some crappy ad that I don't want to see anyway. And if, if I could find any way of doing it, I'd just block it. Now you might say, well, that's not very nice, Rex, because that ad is what's paying for the content to that, for you to be able to see it for free. Well, yeah, but if I don't get to see it at all because my connection dropped while, while I was waiting for the ad to get done loading, um, then the ad really hasn't helped me see anything, have they? So, you know, I think, uh, um, you know, people are going to have a fairly limited um, uh, sense of humor about this. And, and it's only going to go, it's only going to get more intense, I guess I would say. Uh, let's see, Bina says, 
a tool to know that is in high demand for mobile testing. So long-time listeners will know exactly how I'm going to respond to Bina here, and you're not going to like it too much, Bina, but um, I have made it a ironclad rule um, over the, probably the last 10 years that I don't ever recommend tools um, to people in, in a general setting like this, uh, general setting being webinar, classroom, something like that. I'm of the opinion that unless I have actually sat down in your organization and spent some time studying the, your, your re specific requirements and constraints um, that would affect the use of testing tools in your environment, I, actually, I have nothing useful to say to you uh, about tools um, that you couldn't find out in five seconds by using Google. So rather than make some, you know, shoot from the hip kind of statement about, you know, some of my clients are using XYZ and they really like it, um, I'm just going to say do your homework on this. There's there are good descriptions of how to do that. We've done webinars on how to do that. There's stuff on the ISTQB foundation and advanced test manager web or uh, syllabi that talk about how to do that. Uh, do your homework. Um, I've just seen too many instances of this, you know, toxic tool situation where an organization is really, really suffering from a suboptimal tool selection. And all too often it was, well, somebody told me this is a really great tool for X. Or back when I was at company Y, we used this tool and it worked great for us, so this is why we installed it. So I'm sorry, Bina, but I, I don't I don't do that because not because I don't want to help you, but specifically because I do want to help you and I would be anti-helping you if I um, rattled off facile, uninformed answers to your question right now. Um, Lena says, I started testing mobile apps in early 2001. We were having trouble connecting to the access point because the mobile device had the antenna next to the power supply. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, great moments in electrical engineering design there. I mean, that's that's pretty uh, pretty good. Somebody, <laughs> somebody decided to put the antenna right next to the power supply on the device. Um, that must have been a real bear to track down, too. I mean, I know having done a number of hardware software systems tests that, uh, you know, these uh, those kind of situations where you get these sort of intermittent problems or flakiness of some kind or another that turns out to be due to not a defect in the hardware, but actually a design flaw in the hardware is just uh, quite uh, quite interesting. Um, Amit here has a comment, uh, what's wrong with screaming DevOps? Uh, well, <laughs> I guess the reason I was bringing that up is because there's a lot of uh, uh, faddish stuff that goes on with respect to um, uh, life cycles. And um, I'm, I'm on the record as being pretty skeptical about the life cycles as some sort of magic, uh, magic bullet um, to, to fix um, uh, problems in, in development organizations. I mean, I think, I think we've spent the last 20 years laboring under the delusion that that was how we were going to make everything get better in software. You know, starting with uh, CMM and then CMMI, and now we've got you know Agile and Lean and DevOps and TMMI and TPI and all of this kind of stuff. That's all about lifecycle tweaks and making sure that our lifecycle looks just like this, that, and the other. All growing out of this sort of um, at this point inapt analogy between software engineering and manufacturing. Um, you know, same thing, you see the same thing with um, the, um, you know, Six Sigma and, and um, trying to apply Six Sigma to 
software engineering. And Amit, I think you were you were at, in the webinar where I sort of criticized that and brought out, well, you know, this is this is sort of an indictment of software engineering because we can't do that yet. Uh, and it's just it, we're not there. So, but we try to be there. We try to pretend that we're there, and we apply manufacturing types of concepts like you know the fundamental idea of total quality management that if we get the process right the quality of the product will inevitably follow and and undergo orders of magnitude improvement well assuming that we've been moving the needle in the right direction for the last 20 years we should have seen orders of magnitude improvements in, in the quality of our software and our productivity but we of course have not so you know i think that's that that would be my what's wrong with screaming devos there's nothing wrong with DevOps and continuous deployment if, if, if it works and makes sense in your context, but there is plenty wrong with assuming that any sort of life cycle or other process choice or improvement is going to magically yield uh, orders of magnitude improvements in the quality and productivity of an organization because, as I said, the last 20 years have been uh, um, proof positive that that is not the case. In fact, I say 20 years, but it's not. It's actually closing in on 30 now. I think if, if you think of when the Software Engineering Institute was constituted, I think that was mid 80s. Um, hmm. I got a comment here. Uh, from a guy named Bill who says, "Thank you for the webinar. This is not what I expected," and he's already left. I did not expect to hear about the state of applications today versus yesterday and other generalized discussions. I was expecting more specifics. A lot of what was said is kind of understood. If you support Android and Apple phones and tablets, you might ident identify one example of each. And thank you for the free webinar, but it's not what I was expecting. Um, well, I'm sorry, it wasn't what you were expecting, Bill. Uh, if you know Bill, you can pass this on to him. Uh, one can only be so specific in the space of 45 minutes when or an hour when talking about a broad subject like um, mobile app testing. So my intention was to uh, make sure that you know you were all aware of the various challenges that are out there and get you started to think about them. If, um, of course, I did not expect that, that uh, any of you who've been around mobile devices would be unaware of all of them, but it's quite possible that you might be unaware of some of them. Um, <clears throat> but well, as the saying goes, you can't satisfy everybody. Uh, so let's see, Amit has a question here. General question, mobile apps testing is a huge space to cover, and to my point, to the extent that any product must make some compromises. Do you have any advice on how to decide what should be in scope for testing? I read a bit about using mobile analytics to do that, but I wonder what would you consider a good guideline to, deter to determine what is important for my app and how to test it. So, yeah, certainly mobile analytics, you know, the more information you can get that gives you insight into how your customers are using your product, the better, right? And I mean, that's, and that's just generally true, right? I mean, you could be testing any, any number of kinds of software for that statement to be true. Um, you know, looking at trends for where devices are going, trying to shoot ahead of the moving target to some extent, you know, I think is another thing you need to do. Uh, risk analysis, um, so that you get some sense of, of what could go wrong and where those, those areas are um, and relative risk of those different areas. Um, <clears throat> doing some sort of uh, usability testing by walking around kind of thing, um, going to uh, um, do some, uh, take some maybe early prototypes of some of your apps or something like that, take them into a mall or a, um, some other public place and see if you can buttonhole some people to give you some feedback on the apps in real time so you're actually like communicating to the customers because, you know, one of the problems with relying purely on production failures, which of course you should look at, you should look at production failures, is, you know, how how many customers actually take the time to pick up the phone or to send an email and say, you know, I use your app and I kind of like your app, 
But there's this thing about it that kind of bothers me, and I wish you would do this a little differently. They're probably not going to do that. They're either going to keep using it if they think that they can get along with it, or they're going to just go off to, to a competitor, right? Whereas if you can get out into the real world with some prototype early version of your app or, or the real honest-to-God app and get it in front of people and, and watch how they interact with it and ask them, hey, what you know, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? That could give you some real insights. And you might say, ah, you know, nobody's ever going to do that. They're not going to give us the time. You'd be surprised what people will do for a, for a T-shirt, for a gift certificate. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's really... It is amazing what people what people will do in those situations. They might just do it just because they're interested or just because they felt um, complimented that you asked them their opinion. I think a lot of people probably go through life thinking nobody cares about what they think anyway. And having someone come up to them and say, I'd be interested in um, your opinion on this particular thing, and they might say, that's great. And if they don't have time, then they don't have time. They, the person who just says, bah, bah, I don't have time, I'm not going to do that. You know, this is the same person who's going to download your app, take one look at it and say, to heck with it, and off to something else. So that's kind of some quick thoughts there, I mean, I mean, this is something I'd need to study in more detail, but just maybe those are throwing some things out that maybe are helpful to you. Uh, let's see, John says, good webinar, Rex. Don't let the guy get you down. <laughs> um just curious, do you use a Windows phone still? I do, but I think there are only a few of us now. I actually don't anymore other than, I mean, I have it, and it, if my Android phone, when my Android phone broke, this nasty G4 boot loop error last week, um, I went back to using it for uh, temporary purposes. I tell you, it's, it's too bad, John, because... The hardware, the Nokia hardware is fantastic. Uh, it's in terms of the the capabilities of the hardware itself, I don't think I've ever had a better phone. Um, but the Windows operating system on it is just so abysmally bad. I mean, it's just memory leak hell and completely unreliable. It has to be rebooted all the time. And um, when it's rebooted, its, it's recovery time is just incredible. Um, so, yeah, I, I just gave up on it. And, again, it's, it's too bad. If, if, if I could figure out a way of running Android on my Nokia phone, my what is it, 940, Lumia 940, um, I would be tempted to do that. I haven't spent any time on it, but, you know, it might be something. If I could figure out a way of um, getting an Android running on that, and if any of you know how to do that, you can send me a link. I'd be curious to try it because... If I could get that to work, to run Android and use that as my phone, I'd be tempted to do it. It's Nokia hardware's fantastic stuff. Uh, let's see, Amit says thanks, so I guess I was able to provide some useful thoughts. Um, Joe asks, do any of your test courses provide an in-depth look at automated testing? If yes, what do you recommend? Well. Um, Joe, I, I don't want to do a commercial here on, on the webinar. Um, we do have some, some training courses that talk about um, test automation in fairly general terms, um, and you can find the course outlines fairly easily on our website for that. Uh, but if, you, uh, if what you're looking for, Joe, is training that's relevant to a specific tool, uh, we um, have chosen not to go into that business um, just because it's you get too married to the individual tool vendors and um, you know, it's just not something that we, we really thought that we could make uh, um, make a decent living on if it were an, and or add a lot of value over what the tool vendors were doing. So uh, I guess we're not probably not able to help you. What I'd encourage you to do, Joe, if you've got any more questions, send an email to info at rbcs-us.com, and we'll do our best to uh, point you in the right direction. And if we can't help you, uh, we might be able to point you to some other folks who can. Uh, let's see. Lena says, having users' input is very important because I, <clears throat> excuse me, because I have seen mobile projects fail uh, when the software was not designed with the end user in mind. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I've seen other types of projects fail for that same reason as well. Usability really is um, becoming more and more important. 
especially you know as software becomes more and more ubiquitous um, it's it's you, you get you get people interacting with software that don't have the time energy sometimes even ability to get trained in the use of it it just needs to be you know blindingly obvious as to how the thing works and anybody should be able to do it but certainly with mobile devices because of the um, basically non-existent non-existent barriers to exit that anybody who gets sick of, of an app uh, that does one particular thing can probably find a hundred options to do that same thing I mean I wouldn't be surprised if you can find free apps that will allow you to classify butterflies based on camera pictures of the butterfly. Uh, you know, that, that kind of ridiculously um, easy barriers, uh, non-existent barriers to exit, to just abandonment of an app is the easiest thing. Um, usability is going to be really important there. That, that somebody can't figure out how to use the app, they're just going to throw it overboard. I, I've, I've actually looked at, I think, seven different business card scanning apps for my Android phone over the last uh, month. And every one of them I just tossed within the space of about um, 30, 30 to 60 seconds of initially downloading it. It'd be like, oh, it wants me to create a account and post my um, contacts into the cloud so on their space so that they can spam them. No thanks, I'll go somewhere else. Oh, it can't actually share the contact information into my uh, Android contact list. I have to actually do some kind of weirdness with it. No thanks. I'll just try something else, you know. So, um, you know, that's the kind of, uh, of world that you're you're serving. Uh, I've got a last question here from Sush Sushma, who is the fellow who was having trouble hearing earlier. So I guess he that was a transient audio problem. Uh, thanks for the webinar. Do you have follow-up seminars on similar on same similar topic? Okay, so. As I said, this is an excerpt from a longer course that, of course, goes into a lot more detail in each of the areas that I discussed. So if you're interested in training, then, you know, again, come to our website, take a look there. I'm not going to uh, bu burst out into full advertisement mode here. Um, in terms of what's available for free, um, lots of stuff. So we do these we free webinars once a month. Um, so you get on our mailing list and you'll get an invite a couple weeks beforehand letting you know to sign up. Those are free, always have been, always will be. We've been doing them for seven years now. Uh, they are all recorded, and once recorded, they are placed on the Internet, on our website, and also on our YouTube channel. So those, again, are free. So given that we've been doing this for seven years, simple math will tell you that you've got over 80 of these recorded webinars out there. Again, all free. Um, and as you've seen from this webinar, it's not commercial. Um, it's not an attempt to sell something. This is a, it's free information. Um, so um, that's uh, that's all. Those are all resources that are out there for you, and, I, and hopefully you can find something of interest uh, in 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 that collection. All right. So um, to close the session again, a little bit more about the resources. Um, most of which I've already mentioned. Those the free webinars. Um, if you do want a special webinar presentation for your company only of this webinar or any of the other topics that we covered uh, in our webinar series, you can send us uh, uh, email info at rbcs-us.com. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter at rbcs-us.com. This will get you valuable discounts on consulting and training services, in some cases fairly deep discounts on classes and, and um, virtual courses and so forth. Um, you also get a newsletter every other month that will have a featured article, uh, more free content, as well as news about what we're doing. Um, you can see our Twitter and Facebook contact information there. Um, the RBCS Twitter handle is the official one. Uh, like a test dog is personal. If you don't want to see any kind of personal types of posts, just focus on the RBCS one. Don't forget to check your email because you could be the lucky winner of the free learning course. Um, we're trying to resurrect the blog, so rbcs-us.com slash blog, um, and uh, see if we can get some discussions going there. That A lot of that's just kind of going on on the Facebook page, but we'll see what we can do. Um, and, uh, yeah, digital library, all the recorded webinars, podcasts, videos are out there. There's uh, 
podcasts of the webinars that uh, you can subscribe to via iTunes or the RSS feed on our site. Um, and also you can subscribe to the RBCS channel on YouTube for the, the uh, recorded webinars. Um, these are free resources offered as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS we are a not just for profit company. So this concludes the webinar. Thanks to everyone for joining us and hope to see you next month.